So, yeah, well, so. let's see, you want to know how I started? Yeah, and then... <clears throat> well, first of all, I was born and raised in Cicero, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Cicero became famous because El Capone lived there with the... <laughs> the um, and then, so Cicero became a very... Everybody knew about Cicero. Uh, they happen to have, you know, uh, since I'm 94, I was born in May of uh, 1929, so I lived right through the Depression. And, uh, well, I'm a product of the school system. Uh, they came around to school and they were passing out instruments, and I wanted to learn the violin, and that instrument still touches me. But uh, um, everybody thought that it, violin was much too complicated, and my, my parents, who were not musicians at all and were immigrants, uh, felt that, you know, my mother wanted me to play the accordion so I could play all the Czechoslovakian tunes and all that. And uh, I couldn't stand the accordion. And uh, we had a friend of the family that played trumpet. And, of course, in those years, uh, you know, people didn't hire babysitters when they went to a dance. They would take the kids along. And I used to sit up on the stage and watch this guy play trumpet. And, uh, of course, I didn't know it at the time. The guy was half drunk. <laughs> and he was all red in the face and working very hard. And I can remember thinking to myself as a kid, you know, can't be that hard. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I took up the trumpet and I went through the, played in the grade school band. And then in high school, we had an extraordinary high school department. Uh, they have, had been national co-champions uh, of a high school band. And I think uh, there was a, probably at one point there was a guy, there was one person from every, uh, in every orchestra that was an alumnus of this high school. Wow. It was, oh, it was incredible. What high school is that? It, it was called Morton, uh, J. Sterling Morton High School in Cicero. And, you know, even in those days, they had guys from the Chicago Symphony coming in coaching the brass sections and, and the woodwinds and strings and whatnot. And then after, um, after I graduated high school, uh, I, I, I really didn't uh, know. My, my parents wanted me to be a tool and die maker. And uh, I made a micrometer from scratch. Oh, wow. You know what a micrometer yeah, I is. Yeah. yeah, I still have it in the box yeah. over there. But anyway, uh, so uh, but uh, history has a way of turning things around. Uh, my mother um, developed cancer, and she was operated on right after I graduated high school, and they told us that she had six months to a year to live. Wow. She never made the six months. She oh, made five. I'm sorry. And, of course, I was working then in a factory in Sunbeam, uh, you know, where they make all those appliances and yeah. that. Yeah. I had a job in the tool room there. How, how old were you then? Uh, how old were you then? 18. I was wow. right out of high school. And so for a whole year, I worked <clears throat> in, the, in the tool room at Sunbeam. In the evenings, I would play, uh, I would go and sit in with any orchestra that would have me, like Chicago Music College, the University of Chicago, uh, DePaul University. I would sit in with those. And then every Friday and Saturday, I played dance band gigs. I, loved, I played in big bands, and um, I loved doing that. Polka bands, love. You name it, and I played it. Lonely Hearts Club dances and and uh, just about every monkey job you could imagine I played. And, uh, well, after a year, uh, when I was about 19, 
I had the opportunity to audition for a scholarship at the Chicago Music College, and they gave me a scholarship that paid uh, like two-thirds of everything, which even then was a considerable scholarship. They had 22 trumpet players in that school, and they were all jazzers. You know, that was the, that was the era of uh, Dizzy Gillespie and, and uh, you know, bebop was really coming in. And uh, nobody knew how to transpose, and they needed a first trumpet for the orchestra. And of course, I was studying transpositions, and so I, I went to the Chicago Music College for two years. Uh, at the same time, I was playing in the Chicago Civic Orchestra. I had auditioned and made it into there. The Civic Orchestra was the orchestra that was sponsored by the uh, Chicago Symphony. And it was a training orchestra for, uh, it was set up by the great conductor, uh, Frederick Stock, who conducted Chicago for almost 40 years. Uh, he set that civic orchestra up as a training orchestra so that whenever he'd have a, vac a vacancy in the orchestra, he'd have, he'd have like, um, the minor leagues pull right. the guy up, yeah. you know. So did they ever pull people up to play like, you know, something with additional trumpet players or offstage stuff? And, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so uh, I played in the Civic. I did that for two years. I, I really didn't care much for the music college. I, I, I felt that there were, uh, that I was one of the few guys there that wanted to really study. There were a lot of people there that wanted to have parties, and you know, it was a <laughs> kind of a happy-go-lucky school in a way. But uh, um, along came the Korean War, and of course, um, I had heard uh, all through high school. I was in high school during World War II. Uh, our band director would talk about the nine guys that were playing in the West Point band that were from our high school. Oh, wow. And uh, so I heard, you know, what a wonderful thing it was to be in the West Point band and near New York City where guys could go and study. And so when that Korean thing hit, I, I wrote a letter to West Point right away. It turned out that one of the <coughs> instructors uh, at the Chicago Music College was uh, was a guy from my high school. His name was Dvorak, and he uh, he played French horn. And he went back to West Point just before the Korean War as a second lieutenant. So he was one of the assistant conductors. So I wrote him a letter. If they had an opening, I'd like to audition. And sure enough, they had an opening, so I got on the first train and went. People were telling me I was nuts, you know, that the Korean War was going to blow over in a week or two. Even Adolf Herseth, the first trumpet of the Chicago Symphony with whom I was studying, didn't want me to go. He says, my God, everybody knows you're going to be the next guy in the Chicago Symphony. And I said, you know, I'm about ready to be in the Chicago Symphony about as much as I'm going to be Emperor of China. <laughs> I mean, I didn't feel I was ready at all. Yeah. But uh, a lot of people thought I was. Anyway, um, so I went in and I got into West Point Band, and surely I um, went to, uh, went down to New York and... and um, got to study with Nat Prager, and I also studied with Harry Glantz, who was the first trumpet of Toscanini's NBC Symphony. Yeah. Harry Glantz was Mr. Trumpet of our business at that time, um, more so than Adolf Herset. He was just starting out. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> so I did my three years at West Point, and just before getting discharged, I wrote to uh, 30 symphony orchestras uh, asking if in the event of an opening, I would like the privilege of coming to play for them and uh, to audition for them. 
Um, I, of all the 30 orchestras that I wrote to, I think I only got about eight answers. But uh, the, one of the answers I got was from the Cleveland Orchestra, which is one of the big five, you know. Yeah. And so I played that, and the conductor did like my playing. Actually, he told me he was going to send me the contract when he got back to Cleveland, which is something he never did. But anyway, <laughs> um, so you tried out your audition for him, and then yeah, and then yeah. He just never he, well, he it felt I was too young and inexperienced, uh, I guess. But about a week later, there was an opening for first trumpet in the Dallas Symphony, and I tried out for that, and I got it. I was twenty-three years old, and and I, I there were about thirty-five other guys auditioning. And I, I got the job as first trumpet with the Dallas Symphony, and I was just starting my career then. Of course, I have to tell you, the Dallas Symphony in those years was a 20-week season. There was no vacation, there was no sick time, there was no pension, there was no health benefits, nothing. It was 20 weeks of work. And as the first trumpet, I was expected to play every bloody piece. And that's fine. That's what I thought they were paying me for. They were paying me extra, more than the fiddle players. So uh, I, I started in with the Dallas Symphony. And, you know, naturally, um, I needed a job, a job for the summer. And there was there's an orchestra in uh, Chicago called the Grant Park Symphony. And it pl plays in Grant Park, which is the park right outside the downtown loop, you know. They call their downtown the loop because of the trains that run around there oh, okay. in Chicago. Okay. And the, the Grant Park Symphony plays uh, eight weeks, four concerts a week, uh, free concerts for people. There's no admission paid for by the city. And they needed a first trumpet, so I auditioned and I got that. So in the summertime, I played at Grant Park for eight weeks, and then I played 20 weeks in Dallas. And in between, I went on the road with uh, Wayne King's dance band, Ice Capades, Ringling Brothers, you name it. Wow. And I was always filling in for somebody that got sick, like Ringling Brothers and Ice Capades. And I do those to try and fill out the year because I had the nasty habit of eating 52 weeks a year. <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, my my father was still alive and he remarried. And so when I was in Chicago, I'd stay with them. And then I'd go down to Dallas. Well, this went on for about five years. And then there was an opening in the Chicago Symphony. And it was for third and assistant first trumpet. And I was encouraged to audition uh, Bud Hurst at the first trumpet. I'm sure you've heard of Hurst. Oh, yeah, the, of course. Uh, yeah. Famous guy. He, uh, he, he wanted me to come and audition, so I did. And I won the audition, and I, uh, I got the job in Chicago. And, of course... Chicago was the major leagues, whereas uh, at that time, the Dallas Symphony was the minor leagues. But I got a lot of experience between Dallas, uh, the, the five, five seasons I played down there, and then the five seasons I played at Grand Park in the summers. Uh, but then I went to the Chicago Symphony, and uh, being the assistant first trumpet is like being a relief pitcher on a baseball team. You know, you're sitting around waiting for the main guy to fall apart so you can go and play. Well, that wasn't, that wasn't exactly my idea of why I wanted to play the trumpet. But I was, it was a learning experience. And I did that for eight years. I was in the, in the orchestra. In the meantime, I had auditioned for several jobs, and I won the auditions, and always something 
either either I wanted too much money or something else happened. And, you know, in my career, I took 14 auditions and I won 12 of them. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I uh, I used to like to audition. I, I always used to feel that if I could play my solo dates as well as I... As I played the auditions, I'd really be up way up there. But anyway, um, I was in Chicago for eight years. In the meantime, we got married. We had a couple of kids. And then there was a first trumpet opening in, in Detroit. And so I left the Chicago Symphony to go to Detroit. We sold our house in Chicago, bought a house in Detroit, and moved the family. And I went to Detroit thinking that, well, this is going to be the end of the road. You know, I mean, this is where I'll stay. Detroit was a wonderful orchestra, it was a really top-notch band. And I thought, and it, and it paid decently. Uh, so I thought, well, that'll be it. Well, I was in Detroit for nine years. Um, at the end of eight years, I got a call from the New York Philharmonic that Bill Vacchiano, the first trumpet, was retiring and they wanted me to come and audition. Uh, I didn't know anybody. In, uh, I knew the trumpet players in the Philharmonic, but uh, you know the personnel manager to call me, I didn't know this guy at all. Uh, he got my name. You know, they, were, they were calling all the first trumpet players all around the country to come and audition for the Philharmonic. Well, I, I always liked New York. I always felt I didn't want to go to sleep there because I thought I'd miss something, you know. <laughs> but I, uh, but I, uh, somehow I just couldn't see myself playing in a Philharmonic. And if we were going to live in a suburb, we lived in a lovely suburb in Detroit called Huntington Woods. It's a wonderful place. We still have great friends from there. Uh, I would have had to move to Connecticut or someplace to live way out, and I didn't want all that traveling. And somehow something didn't feel right I want, and I said, I'm not going to try. Well, exactly one year later, I came home from playing a Messiah with the uh, Detroit Symphony, and it was an afternoon Messiah, a Sunday afternoon, and then we had Christmas time off. And I come walking in the house and my wife said, the Philadelphia Orchestra just called you. Uh, Mason Jones, the personnel manager, called and uh, they would like you to come and audition. And I thought, well, I had always been a great admirer of the Philadelphia Orchestra. But in my opinion, I thought it was the greatest orchestra in the world. And I heard so many orchestras. So I thought, you know, all these years of practicing, I'm going to try for this one. I First of all, you know, I was 45 by then. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, they're probably going to want some 29-year-old kid with 28 years experience. <laughs> and... Uh, but the funny thing was, I won and I played the audition and I won the job. And uh, so we sold a house in Michigan, bought a house here in Philadelphia, and, moved. and uh, I did 20 years uh, as first trumpet with the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra. In my career altogether, playing in orchestras, I played 42 years. That's a lot of culture, pal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's enough culture for four lifetimes. Uh, yeah, well, the, the thing that I was particularly grateful about was that uh, Eugene Ormandy, the conductor, and there's a couple of pictures of him up there, uh, he really liked my playing, and he was the one that developed the Philadelphia sound, and he had been the conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra for 44 years, you know, that's, that's, that's a whole lifetime. 
And uh, uh, I just thought the orchestra was, was so incredible. I would sit there and count measures and I'd forget what the hell I was counting <laughs> because I was so, in, I was just swept away. The sound of the strings and the woodwinds and, <clears throat> and the morale was quite good. Morale in the orchestra was good and uh, um, so I felt that I had really arrived. Well, after five years with Ormandy, he was 81 and they decided to retire him. Uh, they were concerned about his health, you know, at that age to be. And then they brought in uh, Riccardo Muti, the Italian conductor. He was with us for 12 years. And then he left, and then uh, they brought in Wolfgang Samalich, the German conductor, who I played with for three years. Now, the funny thing is, you know, I, I taught at the Curtis Institute for 32 years. I taught a lot of, in a lot of places, and I like teaching. Uh, <clears throat> that's a little bit about my career. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how I met Claude. You know, in, in right 58 or 59, somewhere in there, uh, the, the big band business was sort of going downhill. So the Musicians Union decided to have an international dance band contest. And uh, there was a band that I played with in Chicago that was awfully, awfully good. And they were one of the finalists. And even though I was in the Chicago Symphony, I would sit in with these guys and play <laughs> because I, I loved big bands. I but think, anyway... I uh, think the last time we talked, when yeah. after you'd retired from the Philadelphia Orchestra, you were telling me that you were playing some big band gigs. I did, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes, right. Anyway, uh, so uh, uh, Claude Gordon's band won that contest. And I remember they, uh, they came to Chicago and played, and I heard Claude play, and uh, the band was really good that he had. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, sometime later, I got to meet Harry James. Uh, there was a guy playing trumpet in, in, who was from Chicago, who I knew, uh, playing with Harry's band. And they had a couple of guys in the section who had studied with Claude. And they were talking about, talk, you know, a bunch of us were sitting there talking, and, and they were talking about Claude. And then I saw uh, Claude's first book, and so I, you know, and when I saw that he had studied with Herbert L. Clark, because I had always been uh, very, very interested in Herbert Clark and how he developed his career, and I collected all kinds of stuff about Clark. And to, to see that here was Claude, well, anyway, to make a long story short, uh, I collected uh, Claude's books as they came out. And <clears throat> uh, then in 1979, I was one of the featured, uh, featured speakers and players at the uh, ITG in Tempe, Arizona. I've, and, I've actually got the audio of that on my website. Uh -huh. And I think, um, doesn't um, Charles Cohen introduce Claude? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. And uh, I went to hear Claude's talk. And, uh, of course, I, uh, I was listening to. And then the funny thing was uh, I did, had to do my business. And uh, I talked and I played. And I did quite a bit of playing. Well, the last thing I played was a, a Herbert Clark cornet solo. I always loved those cornet solos. And uh, I, I no fin sooner finished playing and the applause was over. And here comes Claude. He came up on the stage and he was congratulating me on how, how much he liked my work. And we got to talking and we 
just hit it, hit it off right off the bat. And uh, we spent so much time talking there about, um, about uh, Herbert Clark and, and, um, and the best thing about Claude is he almost never talked about his own ability and, and yet um, the guy was, uh, you know, if you heard the records he made, those, uh, he was not really a jazz man, but he had incredible technique and incredible facility. And uh, it was something that you had to really admire. And so there was that when we were in Tempe, Arizona then, he said to me, he said, listen, I have a trumpet camp every, uh, every summer. Would you be willing to come out and uh, be the legitimate show at the <laughs> camp? And uh, I said, oh, I'd, I'd love that. I'd, I could probably ask the management if I can have that week off and fly out there. And then that's how things with Claude and I started. And of course, I took a lot of his books with it. I had him, I can show you, I had him autograph them. And, uh, and then in 1982, I was asked to go to Prague. Uh, every five years, they had an international trumpet competition in Prague. It was called the Prague Spring. And it was a whole month-long music festival. There were all kinds of symphony orchestras came, played operas, chamber music, and there was always a comp competition for different instruments. Once every five years, it was trumpet. Sure, and they had never had an American judge. They had a Russian judge, German judge, English judge. So, and, and plus the fact that I could speak their language, <laughs> that uh, my father was from there. And uh, uh, so uh, the, it was kind of a put up job in a way because uh, all the Czech trumpet players wanted me to come there. And so I did. And I used to, I used to take a whole load of, they, they, at that time it was under communist rule. And- So what, what oh, that you said like 82? 82 was 82. the first time I went, 82, 85, uh, 91 we played there with the uh, Philly Orchestra, 92 uh, was there and I also made my solo recording there, 97 and 2003, I was there six times. Wow. And uh, of course, you know, uh, under the communist rule, they, they couldn't get mouthpieces, they couldn't get... Uh, I used to bring them a whole bunch of, you know, the guys would send me a letter of what they needed, what kind of mouthpieces, and I'd go to a music store and I'd buy uh, maybe a dozen mouthpieces. They, they all wanted Bach mouthpieces. I'd buy a, a dozen mouthpieces, and then I'd pick up all kinds of music. Yeah. You know, not only just Claude Gordon's music, but the, the Clark books they couldn't get. And yeah, I heard a story, well, you remember like at the Claude Gordon camps, um, Arturo Sandoval was there. You remember Arturo Sandoval at the at the Claude Gordon camps? Oh well, yeah, he was the jazz show. That's how uh, Arturo <laughs> and I became friends. Yeah, but I heard a story that he told before where he had, they snuck a Clark book from maybe the Soviet Union to Cuba and they didn't have photocopiers, so they drew like five lines on the paper and copied the whole book. Yeah. By hand, <laughs> oh, so yeah. that they could get the Clark book. Yeah, right. Well, <clears throat> could you get? In, would they get in trouble if they got if they got no, found no, out if they, they had it or just? You they know, I get brought it? the stuff in. Uh, I never had any problems with the, uh, uh, you know, as the military was everywhere, uh, bringing my suitcase in. Um, they'd ask me, well, what are you, are you bringing something in? And I said, oh yeah, I have some, uh, I have some music that I want to give some of the guys. And, and then and they never bothered me. Of course, actually it was the government that was inviting me. So oh, they, they cool. yeah, they, um, 
uh, and they sort of treated me with kid gloves and plus the fact that, you know, the whole time I was there, I had all these communist guys asking me how I liked it there, you know. <laughs> well, you know, you're not going to tell them uh, what a crappy system they got. Uh, <laughs> because they, that would have been the end of that. Yeah, you might get locked so, up. So, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, I think it's... A, actually, there were certain things that I thought were... Uh, that the, the communists uh, ran. Not that I would ever become a communist or anything like that, but uh, I could understand uh, what what the attraction for that was, you know, that uh, a lot of people that that were poor and whatnot uh, uh, managed to get decent educations and that uh, if they belonged to the party, they, you know, so they had to do... Um, well, as you mentioned Arturo Sandoval, he was in the party in Cuba, right. and he had an awful time with our State Department here, and yet, I remember when uh, all these different Russian trumpet players and Russian musicians, they were all members of, uh, the, in order to have a career, Dukshitzer, the great Russian trumpet right. player, who was a dear friend of mine, and I used to see him in Prague every five years. He was the Russian judge. He would have had, never had a career if he wasn't a communist, never. Right. Right. He had to be in the party. And the same way with all the big names, Rostopovich and all of those people. Uh, that's the way that game went. But anyway... So, uh, the, so the Claude Gordon books, I remember you you brought the Claude Gordon books over there. And I knew Claude mentioned Anatoly Selyan. Oh, Selyan, yeah. I think he took some lessons with Claude, but there was a... Uh, there was a letter that I saw one time. I don't know where it is. It there's they put Claude's stuff in a library somewhere up in Il Illinois. But I personally saw a letter that Doc Schitzer had written to Claude thanking him for the books. Oh but yeah. But you were the one that actually brought the books there. Well, right, I no, him, right? I, I no? didn't give the books to uh, Doc Schitzer. Doc Schitzer got them someplace else. Uh, but the Czech trumpet players, all the Czech all trumpet Czech. players, uh, uh, the, uh, the Czech Philharmonic and the Prague Symphony, those guys all had the books. So they worked out of those books? and Oh, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. And uh, I'll tell you one of the stories that several people told me this at the Claude Gordon camps, who people that were in the cabin next to you said that they heard someone playing the the range study on systematic approach and you were playing like to E above double C or something like that. Oh, well, yeah, I did. <laughs> and they are like, who is that? And I was I like, have to, yeah, I have, to, I have to tell you, you know, I was playing on big bands when I was, what, 14, 15, 16? And I had, uh, I had a pretty good range. I could get up to an E sometimes an F, uh, but it wasn't until later that uh, I not only got a hold of uh, Claude's books and started working on them to extend my high register, uh, the Maggio system, mm -hmm. and Claude had studied with Maggio. So I, and, but I thought that Claude had taken the uh, the Maggio system much farther. Mm -hmm. and it, um, but anyway, it was that that sort of thing that uh, helped my... Uh, I could play then up to a double C, like, no... I had it. <laughs> I don't have it anymore, <laughs> but I had it then when I needed it. I, well, I needed it because of that damn Brandenburg concerto. <laughs> and I was, you know, I must have played that thing a dozen times in my career. And you had to have really good high chops for that, uh, to do that. It was uh, different than just screaming out in a band somewhere. This was, you had to control that range. 
better because you were playing with a flute and an oboe and a violin. Uh, anyway, uh, those, uh, I was trying to think of how many camps I played at, uh, three or four. Well, I was at, my first camp was 84. And you were the soloist in 84. Okay. And I then think that must have been the first one I played. I, you might have done one before it. It was, but I think you were at all the camps after that. I think you would like come every year, even yeah, if you he weren't want, soloist. Right, he wanted me to come. Like I remember Alan Kaplan, trombone player. I think, oh, yeah. The next yes, year. yes. And Bob O'Donnell did one year. Bob, yeah. And Larry Skinner. Remember Larry Skinner? Larry Skinner, yeah. Um, uh, Dominic Spera. Was it? Yes, he I was remember one that. Of them. Yeah, and, you're bringing up a lot of names yeah, that I hadn't thought about. The, the last one, I wish I would have gotten a photo of it, but the I think the last camp was 93, and I remember Doc Schitzer was there, Yuan Racy. Oh, yeah. Louis, yeah, Louis yeah. Davidson was there. Yeah, right. Um, there was well, like you, a, you know, what was happening, uh, the communist system fell apart. And Timofey wandered out of Russia, and so he came, he was visiting. Uh, he was a guest of Louis Davidson's, and Yuan Racy, and a whole bunch of us had collected money because uh, sometime before that, uh, Dukchitzer needed open heart surgery, oh. and even though he was a communist. He had to go to Holland to get that surgery. Wow. And a whole bunch of us kicked in money to help pay for that. And uh, we had quite an organization. Uh, we had people, and there was a guy, a trumpet player, a former trumpet player, working in the State Department in Washington, and he managed to get uh, a refugee status for Dukschitzer so that we could bring him in here. And uh, uh, there was there was a lot of effort. Well, uh, what happened was <laughs> Timofey was there at the camp, and it was at Loma Linda University. Yeah. And it was hot, and I remember he <laughs> he had a sombrero, and I was I was kidding him about uh, wearing a sombrero that he didn't look like a Russian; he looked like a Mexican, <laughs> and. and <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, and he said to me, uh, yeah, I, I could speak a little Russian then, so that's how we got on, because his English was very, very thin. And he wanted to know if it got that hot in Philadelphia, because I had uh, uh, made the offer that when he and his wife would come to the United States, they could stay with us until he got settled. Yeah. And I think he was very touched by that. And, of course, I, to me, I, I, he was the greatest trumpet player I ever heard. I, I enjoyed his playing so much, and I have many of his records. And uh, Anyway, um, yeah, he was at that, and it was so hot, and he, play, he brought his trumpet, and he played then. You remember he yeah. was playing in that gymnasium? And God, the guy just sounded absolutely. I remember hard I had a I had a a CD that I had him sign, and when I showed it to him, I think his wife was there, and he got really excited because he was pointing at it, and his wife did the sculpture that was on the oh yeah, it was like pottery that was yeah, on that it. was his second wife, his uh, his first wife, uh, I think she died, uh, she could speak some English. Because I met Timofey in 1960. It was the first Russian orchestra that came over here, the Moscow State Symphony, and he was the first trumpet. And that's how we met. Uh, they played in Chicago, and, and we spent some time together. Of course, at that time, he was really giving me the whole party line, you know. And I kept telling him, I don't want to talk politics. Let's talk about the trumpet. How, so he wanted to tell you about the Communist Party? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, anyway, well, he, you know, he was from a peasant family. Yeah. And he was Jewish. Uh, you know, he had a lot of, uh, 
he had a lot of strikes against him according to their system, so he had to be in that party. And um, but he he also felt that it was because he was in that, that he uh, got an education which he wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Anyway, so getting back to Claude though, um, yeah, uh, Louis Davidson and Yuan Racy had brought uh, Timofey over to the uh, and uh, and of course the the one thing that I liked about Claude. It was, uh, he was open. He never felt competition, or he was he was open to let's you know another player, another different sound, another another talent, and uh, and this is the way I always liked it. You know, we have uh, an awful lot of musicians that are constantly competing and uh, I don't think it's necessary. Yeah. But anyway, so that's, that's how all that came about. Also, I would like to say that after I retired from the orchestra at the age of 66, and I was still at the top of my game, I had good chops, and the last concert we played was the Strauss Sein Heldenleben. And um, um, naturally, I nailed everything there. Uh, <clears throat> so my wife always wanted a farm. She's a country girl. She's an invalid now. I have a lady taking care of oh, her. Oh, okay. She's in bed all the time. Um, anyway. Uh, How old is your wife? How old? Yeah, how old? She's 85. Okay. Yeah. You know, she's been ill for years. Well, that's the way that goes. But anyway, uh, so I bought her a farm. Well, we had four, it was not really a working farm. We had 40 acres up west of Allentown in the hills. It was beautiful. And the conductor of the Allentown Band, this picture is right up there on the uh, mantel, uh, Ron Demke, uh, he, he came to see me once. Of course, I had soloed with the Allentown Band. The Allentown Band is the oldest civilian band in the United States. Oh. Uh, the oldest civilian okay. band. I think, and I, have your C I think I have your CD where you're playing with them. Yeah, I made a solo yeah, CD I with them. Yeah. It's called Virtuoso. And anyway, uh, so he came and he said, listen, uh, I'd like you to come and play some solos with the band. And I said, fine, I would like to do that, except that I don't want to displace anybody. If you got somebody that's there and doing it, stay with them. I'm not going to push anybody out of a job. I've never done that, and I never will. <clears throat> he said, I don't have, I don't have anybody, and I'd like to have a cornet soloist. So for the next 15 years, <laughs> until I was 81, wow. I played cornet solos with the Allentown Band. We even played at Carnegie Hall. I got a standing ovation there. We played in Kennedy Center in Washington. I got a standing ovation there. So, <laughs> so the career just sort of went. And, but then when we, we bought this, uh, in, when I was 81, and we moved here, uh, well, I, I decided it was time that I really let somebody else get the experience and uh, a lot of people were calling me for all kinds of gigs, and and um, um, I I just you know uh, when I retired uh, the first couple of years I was uh, in retirement I think I did two solo dates a month, a month. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> I remember a number of people called me to come and do. Brandenburg Concerto, and 
And then I had a former student that was teaching at Westchester University. And he said, Frank, we'd like you to come and teach at Westchester. And I said, you know, I never finished for my bachelor's degree because <laughs> you don't have to have it. Come and do it. So it's, it's been a, a really a great ride all the way. And, uh, and uh, as I say, one of the highlights of the ride, you know, there have been, um, like everything, that has its good and bad. I don't care whether you're a doctor, lawyer, president, or what. You're going to have good and bad, and you, you sure can have it playing in an orchestra. But I, um, but you know, you remember the people. Who, uh, you remember certain people that were really good to you, and people that you admired, that you looked up to. And Claude was one of those. I, I, I admired what he did. He taught. He, I thought he was a very honest teacher. Uh, you know, he, he, he taught. He didn't teach them transpositions and etudes and all that, but he taught them how to play. And I think, uh, I think that's important, you know, and the, the breathing exercises and all that. And uh, I enjoyed the lectures that he gave. And I found that he was, uh, he was really a very honest person, I thought. Yeah. Whereas a lot of guys would be doing that sort of thing just to make money. Right. But he wasn't into that. Like and I've if, heard people try to promise that, oh, I'm going to like give you a double high C in so many weeks. And I took from him for 10 years. He never promised anything like that. He was just like, just do this. Yeah. And waited to see what happened. You still have a double high C? I can play above a double high C, yeah. Above? <laughs> yeah. Okay. About an E or an F, somewhere around there. Oh, yeah. good for you. <laughs> well, I don't know. Does that all answer what the... I thought of something that I remember you talking about before is um, that you, you know, like when people started playing C trumpet, and I think you said that you liked playing B flat, oh. but then they switched to C... When did that happen, and what are some things that okay. you, when that you remember how yeah, that happened? I, when I, per, I, I personally like B-flat more oh than C. Yeah. <laughs> when I was a student, and uh, even playing my first five years in Dallas and Grant Park, I played on a B-flat trumpet. Played first trumpet in the orchestra on a B-flat trumpet. Well, when I went to Chicago then, uh, Herseth was a C trumpet player. The whole section used C trumpets. And I remember when I auditioned for Fritz Reiner, the conductor, he said, gee, you know, it sounds like you have a very nice trumpet, but, you know, if you're going to play, you're going to have to use one of ours. Now, the orchestra owned four Bach silver-plated C trumpets. What had happened was Herseth went and had his C trumpet silver plated, so he could. He had a box C trumpet that he won that he really liked, and he wanted to preserve it. So he had it silver plated, and there was some rich guy sitting in the balcony that thought, well, "Wouldn't it be nice to have all four guys <laughs> with uh, with the, the silver plated C trumpets?" And so the orchestra, and he gave money for that, and the orchestra invited Vincent Bach. And he came uh, to Chicago, and he brought four C trumpets for the orchestra. Well, you know, the funny thing is, I liked the B-flat. Nat Prager was strictly a B-flat trumpet player. I started with him. Harry Glantz was strictly a B-flat trumpet player. Uh, Timofey Dukshitzer was strictly a B-flat trumpet player. Well... You know, I, when I came in the orchestra there, I remember I had to, uh, I started with them in the spring because the other guy wanted to be released. He had a radio station job. And uh, I played it on the B flat and you know, the timbre of the sound didn't fit. I was playing a bench, which is not as loud a trumpet as a Bach. 
and uh, but uh, I knew Eldon Benj, the old man, and uh, I loved his horn, but uh, it just didn't fit with. So I had to switch to the, and I had to switch on the job. Now, <laughs> what that involved was relearning all the transpositions from the B flat trumpet to the C trumpet, relearning all the orchestral excerpts from the to the C trumpet. <laughs> well, you know, um, after eight years in the orchestra, when I went to Detroit, uh, there were a couple of people that asked me, so they knew I liked B flat trumpet. They said, Frank, are you gonna go switch back to B flat trumpet? And I said, you know, uh, it, it was such a, it took me better than two years to get used to playing the C trumpet. And since I'm in the orchestra and whatnot, I think I'm gonna stay with the C trumpet. Not that it makes the job any easier, or, you know, you can play higher notes than that. That's ridiculous. It's, uh, that's not the case. Um, I still feel that the, the switching to the C trumpet was a uh, lot of the trumpet players in the symphony wanted to feel that they were exclusive. And uh, to be exclusive would be, you know, you'd play the C trumpet. Well, you know, when I was in the Chicago Symphony, I used to sit with dance bands, and I used to do Broadway shows and all that on the C trumpet yeah. uh, while I was in the orchestra. Whenever I, whenever I had some free time, uh, <clears throat> A lot of people wouldn't try that, you well, know. When I when I um, I grew up in Bakersfield, California, and there was a guy that I don't know if you ever ran into named Charles Brady, Chuck Brady. He played principal in in the National Symphony for six years, and then he recorded List Wagner Soldat with Stravinsky. Oh, and that's what I heard. That. Yeah, he did that, um, but he played nothing but C. And so when ice capades would come through Bakersfield, or oh, yeah. if there's a dance band, he played he played lead trumpet on C. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, uh, I still felt, you know, I did the first five years of my career on the B flat that it was possible, you know, and actually for many many years before, the the C trumpet business actually started in Boston. The French trumpet players in the Boston Symphony all played C trumpet because it's that's where they were. They learned the C trumpet in Paris. And it seemed that it was the tradition in Paris for the symphony guys to play C trumpet. And of course, Herset went and studied in Boston when he was discharged from the Navy after World War II. So who who did he study with? And he studied with Georges Marger, the first trumpet, okay. and uh, Marcel Lafosse, okay. the second trumpet. And of course, those guys were all C trumpet players, and so he he latched onto the C, and he liked it, and it was worked for him. Uh, so anyway, uh, but I I felt that there were a lot of people that went to playing the C trumpet because they wanted to feel exclusive, you know. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't enough that they were in the orchestra. So I went along and I played I played everything on the C trumpet. Uh, only a few things I would get the B flat out for. I still had my bench B flat. When my wife got so ill I sold my whole collection because I had to uh, a lot of payments to make. But anyway, yeah. I, I was so upset. I only kept one horn, and that was the C trumpet that I used the last 12 years that I was in the orchestra. It was a Selmer, though. It was a large bore Selmer with a large bell. Um, Is it a, made in 
in France? Or made in Paris, yeah. Okay. And I, I became a, a, a very... In, in didn't, didn't Claude Gordon give you a, one of the prototypes? Yes. See? Yes, he did. Uh, I, have, he, I have one of them. He, uh, he gave one to me. My grandson has it now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I had that uh, bell engraved oh, cool. with Claude's name on it. Yeah. At the, uh, I had uh, uh, Dylan's uh, okay. place in New Jersey. They did, they did the engraving for me on that horn. That's cool. And uh, I did, just recently gave it to my grandson. He That's studied cool. trumpet with me. He's up in Rochester, New York oh, cool. now. But anyway, um, uh, I like the Selmers. Yeah. The Selmer sound. And, well, I play a little bit now, but uh, <clears throat> it's, you know, when you get to be this age, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I don't have the stamina. Um, and... Uh, but I still rem fondly remember the days of, of playing. Yes, Claude gave one of those to me, and he gave one to Arturo Sandoval. Yeah, I remember he gave yeah. Arturo. B and I saw Arturo a couple of years ago. They played here in Philly. I went to see him. Uh, he's a hell of a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah, and what a talent. You know, he not only plays good trumpet, he plays excellent piano. I know. <laughs> and he plays bass, and he plays drums. I know. And he sings. Let me tell you, that guy has got unbelievable talent. I recorded a, a master class that he did that I brought him to South Carolina for, and someone asked him a question. They said, when you're playing all these fast notes, do you know what notes he's, you're singing or you're playing? Then he was like, he got kind of irritated, and he sang all these notes, like 30-second notes. Oh, yeah, it's in solfege. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I did solfege in college. I can't imagine yeah, <laughs> doing it right. that fast. Yeah, he was... Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, Claude gave us each a horn. I think that's the only time in my career that anybody ever gave me a horn. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, I was very touched by that. I offered, I offered to pay for the horn. And it's a, <clears throat> a nice, damn nice horn. It uh, plays beautifully. I didn't use it as much as I should have. Well, of course, they didn't make up until we moved here. Um, until I was about eighty-one, I, I was still playing mostly. Except for the cornet solos, which I played on a B flat cornet, of course, but uh, uh, the, the C trumpet was still. After I had made the initial switch from the B flat to the C, I couldn't see myself switching back. Right. And uh, yeah, I I look back at my career now, and I'm very grateful. Yes that I was born in this country, that I was born white, that I got the education I did, that I got to play in all of the orchestras. I got, I had the kind of career that most people dream about. And I used to dream about it. I, you know, when I was a kid, I, I thought, boy, to play first trumpet in an orchestra, in a symphony. If I had played, if I had, stayed with the Dallas Symphony for my entire career, I think I would have been as happy as a bird too, you know, yeah. because I was doing what I dreamed about. Right. I never dreamt that all of a sudden I'd wind up in Chicago, and, and which was at that time was one of the top orchestras. And then I'd wind up in Detroit and then finally Philadelphia, the, the, the supreme top. Yeah. Uh, well, I think some of it, too, is like you said that immediately you wrote letters to 30 different orchestras. Yeah. I don't think that you aspired to do something better, because yeah. I think some people just get happy just 
being where they are don't try to do something else you know yeah well but you know there's a lot i had uh, incredible luck and uh, a lot of good breaks uh, i had some nasty things happen to me but that's all right uh but you know if if you're gonna pursue a career i don't care where you're gonna go if you're gonna play in a rock band or what, if you have an ambition to be a really good player and you put in your time and you practice and you study, I think you can learn from some of the old timers, learn what to do or what not to do. And uh, I, you know, no matter how difficult the concerts were that I had to play, I still maintained a two-hour-a-day practice. Uh, a lot of guys wouldn't do that. I mean, they would be saving their chops for the show. Well, I was never one to save my chops for the show. Uh, I, I tried to get have always more, more, more endurance than what the job called for. And I felt that that was the way that you had to go. And actually, that's what was expected of you. When I came to the Philadelphia Orchestra, I remember Ormandy, the conductor, called me in and said, Mr. Kondorovic, I know you're new here in Philadelphia and playing with the orchestra. I just want to tell you that <clears throat> you as a principal player are expected to play everything. And I said, well, that's what you're paying, for, paying me for, isn't it? I mean, of course. And I always had the chops, played a whole program, no matter what was on, on the program. And there were a lot of programs that could be quite tiring. And, and, but to try and maintain the endurance, you know, one thing with the trumpet, I think, we spend about 60% of our practice time building and maintaining endurance. You got to, otherwise uh, the thing will disappear on you. Mm -hmm. We have a very perishable thing here with the trumpet, you know. It, it'll disappear on you in a minute. Yeah. And uh, you find the, you know, well, at my age, I don't expect to be playing any double high Cs, but I used to, but that disappeared, and it disappeared very fast. Of course, I have to say, in the last 12, 13 years, I don't practice two, two hours a day. I, I don't, first of all, and I always liked practicing, but I don't care what you play, whether you play in a jazz band, or whether you play in a rock band, or what you do, you gotta practice if you want to become a really good player. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any ambition, well, that's another thing. But I think that most guys that are studying, most people that are studying, uh, have, to, have to spend that time uh, working, looking at books, studying Claude stuff, studying other stuff. You have a little bit of everything. It's not one thing. It's not. I, Annette Prager, always used to tell me, Frank, practicing is like eating a nice seven course dinner. <laughs> you know, you have like slurs, tonguing exercise, scales, and you do all these things. And, the, and um, you know, it was funny, many, many years ago when I first started in that business, you couldn't give me a pedal note no matter how you wrapped it. <laughs> because I, I didn't understand the pedal. I was just a kid. But as time went on, and I realized what people like Maggio and Claude were doing, what the, the pedal notes, relaxing the embouchure and everything, so that they could go, so that there was this counterbalance between the bottom and the top. Right. And that's what you need. Right. And you got to maintain that. 
Right. And that's that's what I think. Yeah. I I can't think of anything else that we could no, talk it was, about. It was great. It was yeah. great.